<clears throat> 1 Kings chapter 14. And so, uh, last time we saw the, the prophet, the, uh, the old prophet and the younger man of God who God sent from Judah up and, and he brought the prophecy. He said uh, that God was going to, to judge the northern tribes and he was going to judge the house of Jeroboam for his introduction of idolatry into uh, the land and <clears throat> the altar split in half and the ashes fell on the ground and Jeroboam reached out to grab him or pointed at him or whatever he did he extended his hand and his hand withered up and he said oh please pray for me that my hand will heal back up and so the man of God did and anyway uh, the man of God lost his life because God told him not to eat not to drink and the old prophet lied to him and and we talked about how strange that was and why he would do that and and uh you know, Julie and I were talking after church, and, and she brought up something that's probably exactly right. She said, you know, the reason why we were talking about why, why would he do something like that? Why would he lie to the man of God and get him to go home with him? And she said, I think he was jealous. And I think you're right. I think he was jealous. He was jealous. Here he is. He's supposed to be a prophet. And God didn't use him to bring this prophecy because I think he was compromised. His whole family was. So he brings in this young man from Judah, and as a result of his jealousy, he, uh, he wanted to, to see if he could, could dupe this young man, and sure enough, he did, and it cost him his life. Well, uh, <clears throat> tonight we're going to pick up in chapter 14 and verse 1. It says, At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. Now, we don't know how old Abijah is. Uh, it's going to call him a child, uh, and so that could be from an infant all the way up. I'm going to say that he is uh, getting into his, um, probably not a teenager, but he's probably nine, ten, eight, nine, ten years old, and I'll show you why I think that. But he falls sick, and Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, and disguise thyself, that thou be not known to the wife, to be the wife of Jeroboam, and get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is Ahijah the prophet, which told me that I should be king over this people. Now, he, he didn't tell her that Ahijah had also uh, 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 told him that he was supposed to be a man of God. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, he tells his wife, he says, I want you to disguise yourself and I want you to go down there. Well, now, well, and let's look at the next. And take with thee ten loaves and cracknels. And cracknels are, are biscuits. Let's just call them, call them biscuits. And a cruise of honey, and go to him, and he shall tell thee what shall become of the child. So, the king's wife is supposed to disguise herself, and she's supposed to take a very modest gift. Ten loaves, some biscuits, and some honey. That's the kind of gift that a poor person might bring. That's not the kind of gift that a king would bring. So, he has his wife disguise herself because she's got to sneak into Judah. She's got to go to Shiloh. And so, so for her to go to the prophet, Jeroboam doesn't want anybody to find out, right? Because he's, he's trying to be sneaky. Because if the people found out that he had questions about what was going on, I mean, he set himself up as one of the priests, right? He's, he's actually burning incense on the altar and offering sacrifices. So why doesn't he know what God's will is? He's having to go and send his wife down there. So he says, I want you to disguise yourself. I want you to take a very humble offering, the kind of offering that a poor person would bring. That way no one will think that the king is actually going to inquire of Ahijah. And so Jeroboam's wife did so. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, verse 3, And take with thee ten loaves and cracknels and a cruise of honey, and go to him. He shall tell thee what shall become of the child. And Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose and went to Shiloh, and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were set by reason of age. And the Lord said unto Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shalt thou say unto her, For it shall be when she cometh in that she shall feign herself to be another woman. And it was so when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet as she came in at the door that he said, Come in thou, wife of Jeroboam, why feignest thou thyself to be another? For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. I, I love it. You know, he may not can see, but he can see. 
And the reason that he can see is because God is communicating with him and he's telling him what's going on. And so, so I'm sure she was very surprised as she sees this old man. His, his eyes are probably hazy and glazed over and he knows exactly who she is. So this is, this is his message. Go tell Jeroboam, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, for as much as I exalted thee from among the people and made thee prince over my people Israel, and rent the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it thee, and yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do that only which was right in mine eyes, but it has done evil. Now watch above all that were before thee more evil than solomon more evil than saul the most evil king that israel has had up to this point is jeroboam okay so one of the things that that you need to understand is is god does not take idolatry lightly it is it is the biggest affront blasphemy and idolatry i mean just think about it if someone is supposed to know who you are, but they refuse to acknowledge you, refuse to call you by name, ignore you. Now, now let's take someone else. Let, let's think about this. Let's think about your mother and father. Let's say you had a good relationship with your mom and dad, and they loved you, and they helped you, and they raised you, and they taught you, and they, they encouraged you, and they gave you all these things. And then when you got older, you refused to acknowledge them, you refuse to even call them your mother and father, and you claim someone else as your mother and father and ignore them. That would be unbelievably hurtful to them, and they would not like that at all. They wouldn't like the other people that you were claiming were your mother and father, uh, and they, they would probably be very upset with you. Well, that's what idolatry is. God is our Heavenly Father. God is our Creator. God gives us everything, life and breath and rain and crops and health and everything that we have. And so to, to take and to, to say, yeah, I'm going to worship these gods or I'm going to worship you in a way that you haven't told me to worship you. is just like saying, I don't know who my mom and dad are. This over here is my mom and dad. Okay, it, it's worse than that, but I'm just trying to think of a good illustration. And so God doesn't take that lightly. He says, I gave you the kingdom, Jeroboam. Isn't that amazing? I, I handed it to you. And I told you, I want you to run it like David did. Worshiping me, loving me, obeying me. If you will do that, I'll put it in your family forever. I, I, you, it'll be perpetual. Okay. And immediately, the first thing he does is not do what he was told. <laughs> and so, so he says, uh, verse 9, But thou hast done evil above all that were before thee. For thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and hast cast me behind thy back. Just like, just like taking and, and just turning your back on God and saying, I don't want anything to do with you. I'm going to worship these gods that I have made that came from my own imagination. Therefore, verse 10, Behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam, and I will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall. Gotta love that King James language, don't you? That one's simple, though. That's easy to understand. That's all the men, okay? <clears throat> and him that is shut up and left in Israel, and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam, as a man taketh away dung, till it be all gone. Now, now I want you to see, the, see what God's doing here. He says, he says, Jeroboam, I handed you all this. I gave you this kingdom, and you threw me behind your back. Therefore, I'm going to throw your descendants away, just like you would clean out the stalls and haul out the manure and throw it out in the pasture. That's what I'm going to do to your family. This is harsh. This is unbelievable. And so, uh, God's not, he's not fooling around. He's not, he, he's, he's dead serious here. And Jeroboam has committed a huge offense to God. Verse 11, him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. For the Lord hath spoken it. Your descendants, your children, your grandchildren, those who make it, 
they are going to be devoured by animals. You are not going to have the opportunity to give them a proper burial. And, and that is, is well, it's, it's two things. One, it is a disgraceful thing. But two, it's a prophesied thing. So let's turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 28 real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 26. This is where um, God pronounces the blessings and the cursings. So at the end of Moses' life, he, he pronounces, he preaches the message of Deuteronomy. And he pronounces blessings and cursings. He says, if you do what God says, I'm going to bless you. If you don't, I'm going to curse you. And so in Deuteronomy 28, 26, he says, And thy carcass shall be meat unto all the fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. Isn't that interesting? No man shall fray them away. Do you remember when we studied the book of Judges? There was uh, some young men at the... Uh, uh, there was a group of people who demanded the sacrifice of, of some of Saul's descendants. And they killed them and they exposed their bodies. And there was a, a woman, Saul's concubine. And if I think for a minute, I'll remember her name. Anyway, do you remember it tells the story that these bodies were exposed and that she camped out out there and her whole time that they were there and kept the buzzards and the crows and the, and the beasts away. From, they wouldn't let the coyotes pick them. You remember that story when we studied the book of Judges? Well, <clears throat> and she was commended for doing that. And David commended her for doing that. Okay, you remember that? Well, one of the greatest uh, disrespectful things that you could do would be to expose a body and not bury it properly. I mean, it's just, it's like adding insult to injury. Uh, I, I've, I've read that, and I believe it was John Wycliffe. The Pope hated John Wycliffe so much that after Wycliffe's death, they went and exhumed his body and burned his bones to just, just one more time just to get him because he hated him so much. And so the desecration of the dead is, is, is what this is saying. Well, well, part of Moses' thing is, is if you disobey God, the Israelites, one of the curses is, is you're not going to have a proper burial. You're going to die like an animal, and you're going to be eaten by, by the fowls and by the beasts. And so that's what God says is going to happen to the descendants of Jeroboam. Verse 12, Arise thou, therefore, get thee, to thine own house. Oh, wait, the, the end of verse 11. For the Lord hath spoken it. God has said this is what's going to happen. Therefore, this is what's going to happen. And so, how important, just, just a little aside, we're about halfway through the, actually we're over halfway through the year. <clears throat> how important is this book? Right here. It is very, 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 very important. Had Jeroboam been familiar with the portion of this book that existed in his day, he might have chosen to do things a little bit differently. I wonder. I don't know, but, but maybe. But I just want to encourage you. God's Word is, is going to come to pass. What God says is going to happen. His Word will run. His Word will accomplish the purpose that He sends it forth to accomplish. And so it's up to you and I to know His Word and to realize what God has said and what He wants to do. Okay, And so He says, The Lord has spoken it. So He tells her, He says, Arise thou therefore, get thee to thine own house. And when thy feet enter into the city, the child shall die. And this reminds me of David. It reminds me of David. The consequence for David's sin with Bathsheba was the death of the child. And you remember that in 2 Samuel as we studied that. And, and so here you are again. You've got a king. You've got a king who has disobeyed God. You've got a king who has sinned. And the very first consequence, and there's going to be more, but the very first consequence is, is this child, however old he is, is going to die. Now here's the reason I think he's probably not quite a teenager yet. So he's still a child, but I think he's not an infant. Here's why. Verse 13, And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him. Now remember, none of Jeroboam's descendants are going to be buried. They're going to be eaten by beasts and picked by the fowls. 
except for Abijah. Now this is Ahijah talking about Abijah. So get your H's and B's right. This is very confusing. And there's another one with the same very, very similar name here in just a minute. But we got to keep all these straight. So Ahijah is telling the wife of Jeroboam that Abijah, her son, is going to die. But he's going to be properly mourned for by the Israelite people. And he's going to be buried. Why? For he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave, because in him there is found some good thing toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Now, how fascinating is that? Here's why I think he's a little bit older. Because in order to find something good toward God in you, you're going to have to be old enough to have what? What's good toward God? You've got to have faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. So I want you to think about this. The high priest of this pagan religion and the king of the country who has introduced this, this idolatry into the land of Israel has a son who believes in God, the true God. Isn't that fascinating? It's fascinating. It's, a, it's one of those things that you should always remember you know, just because you come from a Christian family doesn't mean that you are automatically a Christian. All of us have got to choose to follow Jesus for ourselves. We've got to, we've got to believe in Jesus for ourselves. We've got to, to come to him in repentance and faith and be born again. You can't ride on the coattails of your parents. But it also teaches us that even if your parents don't love the Lord, aren't serious about the Lord, it doesn't mean that you can't be. Because this boy, Abijah, apparently... He, was, he had the beginnings of someone who would love the Lord. And had he been able to grow up, I wonder, wouldn't it be interesting to know what would have happened? See, there's not one believing king from the northern tribes. Not one. From Jeroboam all the way down. And it's not one family. The southern tribes are the descendants of David. And it's going to remain in the family of David for hundreds of years. But not the northern tribes, it's going to be about five different families or maybe more that are going to keep changing. There's going to be murder, there's going to be, be uh, deceit, there's going to be all kinds of things that happen in this northern kingdom. But apparently this boy Abijah would have been heir to the throne. So had God allowed him to stay, there would have been a, a, a believer who could have done away with that idolatrous system when it came his time to be king. Who could have turned the hearts of the people of Israel back to their God? Who could have straightened the mess out that his daddy had made? But because his daddy had sinned in such a way, God says, I'm going to bring him home. Because I'm not going to allow that to happen. And the boy is going to die. Man, it's crazy, isn't it? And so, so I, I just want to encourage you tonight. Faith is something... It's that which pleases God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Hebrews 11.6 and, and you can have that kind of faith. It can be yours. You can be, you can be the Bible-thumping, soul-winning, spirit-filled, Jesus-loving Christian at any age. Whenever you get ready to. You don't have to be a certain age. And... You don't have to. Your daddy might be an idolater. That doesn't mean that you need to be. And uh, one of the things that, that I find, I don't know if you've ever talked to anybody about these kind of things, but I have had several people tell me, you talk to somebody and you share the gospel with them, and maybe they come out of a cult background or, or maybe they come out of, of some other kind of background. And, 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 and as, you, as you discuss the truth of sin and heaven and hell and righteousness and and all those things, there, there comes a point in time where a bell goes off, a, a light bulb clicks, and they go, so you're telling me that my grandmother who didn't believe what you're talking about is in hell. And it is a hard reality. A Jewish person, a person who comes out of a Jewish background, a, a person who comes out of some kind of cult, a person who uh, is, is, you know, been raised in some kind of traditionalist kind of thing. Native Americans. I've had some Native American kids who said, you know, my, my, my parents were, were part of the, the animistic uh, ideology of, of whatever tribe they were from. 
you're telling me that my granddaddy is in hell, my daddy's in hell, my grandma's in hell. I'm like, no, I'm not telling you that. God's word is telling us all that, right? And so it's hard sometimes for someone not to go, for someone to choose a different path than their family. That's a hard thing. But guys like Abijah, we, we realize even in the midst of the high priest of the, 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 the idolatry of Israel, here's a boy that God says, there's something good in him. And for God to say that, it's got to be that his heart is leaning in faith toward the one true and living God. All right, so, so he says there in verse 14, Moreover, there's more to this curse. The Lord shall raise him up a king over Israel who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam that day. But what? Even now. This is coming. This is coming. We're going to read about this in the next, very next chapter. So, so Jeroboam's days are limited and his, his kingdom is going to end. And, and not only that, but his descendants are going to end. Verse 15, For the Lord shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and he shall root up Israel out of this good land which he gave to their fathers, and shall scatter them beyond the river, because, that's the Euphrates River, because they have made their groves provoking the Lord to anger. And he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, who did sin and who made Israel to sin. The king has made a decision and it's going to cost the entire nation. You know, I don't know about you, but as I study, and it's really interesting, every time I've ever been through the kings, well, the thing that, that resounds to me is, is as the king goes, so goes the nation. Well, I want you to allow this to move you to prayer for our country because we have one of the absolute most vile and corrupt administrations in office right now that I've ever seen in my entire life. Nothing but sheer corruption in the White House. From a coke-sniffing, disgusting pervert of a first son to the corruption that we see all around us. And, and you are experiencing it you are just like the tentacles of some kind of, of thing that creeps all the way down local school boards, FBI investigating people at school boards because of, of the, the corruption and the things that we're seeing. I don't want you to be discouraged because of that. I want you to realize that this, this is a time for, you know, we, you and I, we're here for such a time as this. Remember, there's guys like Ahijah. At, at this point in time. And, and there's, there's guys like the man of God that we read about in the last chapter. There's always a, a group of believers that God has. In the United States of America, there's a big chunk of believers. As a matter of fact, very few people that I personally know are not just broken right now as they see what's going on in our country. And so, so instead of letting that discourage you, what it really needs to do is move us to prayer, to cry out to God on behalf of this nation, to cry out to God for the truth, to cry out to God for the gospel to go forth, because that's the answer. The answer is Jesus. The answer is to, to reach people's heart. Like Abijah, to, to even, even in the, the, the very halls of, of the corruption that we see in our country, I promise you there's some believers, there's some Daniels out there. There's some Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are strategically placed in, in colleges and, and, and in the, the, the bureaucracies of our country. They're, they're there. I know they're there. There's, there's somebody in the White House that's a follower of Jesus. Got to be somewhere. I'm, I don't know who it is, but I'm, I'm praying for that person that they'll be a witness, that they'll be a light, and that, and that God can, can get through to this situation. But I want you to see that when it comes to Israel... The whole nation is going to be cast away. He's talking about, now, now what you're going to see is, is the country is going to go into exile in two different, actually in multiple waves, but the first exile is going to be the northern kingdoms in the 700s BC, and they're going to be conquered by the Assyrians. 
And that's what he's talking about here. This is not the Babylonian exile. That's for Judah. This is the Assyrians. And it's going to be an Assyrian invasion. But the Judeans are going to get to come back after 70 years into the land. The Israelites are, it's going to be very different. So in the time of Jesus, you're going to meet a group of people that are called the Samaritans. And what they are is they are Assyrian and other nations that have intermarried with the northern tribes. And, and they have been labeled as Samaritans. So that's, that's what is, is coming. All right, verse 17. Oh, wait, let's turn to Psalm 81 real quick. In Psalm 81, uh, verse 11, we have a summary of, of what happened to Israel. And it just kind of sums it up in a way that's kind of succinct. Psalm 81, 11, But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. That's what he told Jeroboam. He said, you've cast me behind your back. You didn't want anything to do with me. You wouldn't listen to what I said. So, verse 12, I gave them up unto their own heart's lust, <clears throat> and they walked in their own counsels. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I gave them up. Now look with me there. And uh, verse 16 of 1 Kings 14, he shall give Israel up. Now, is he going to give them up forever? No. God still has a glorious future for Israel in our day. There is a glorious future for Israel. When Jesus returns, he's going to deal with the Israelite people, and he is going to reestablish the nation of Israel. And they're, going to be, they're all going to be saved. It's going to be the biggest national revival you've ever seen, ever that's ever happened. But there's going to be an awful lot of pain beforehand. And so, so the consequences of refusing to listen to God are unbelievable. They will, it will cost you your family. It will cost you your future. It will cost you, it could cost you your eternity, the consequences for not listening to God. And, and it's just that simple. That's why I, I believe that, that what we're doing tonight is one of the most important things that you could ever do in your whole life is to listen to the word of God because the, the consequences for not are just more than you ever want to think about. All right, so verse 17, Jeroboam's wife arose and departed, came to Tirzah, and when she came to the threshold of the door, the child died. And they buried him, and all Israel mourned for him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by the hand of his servant Ahijah, the prophet. And the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he warred and how he reigned, behold, they are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel. Uh, by the way, we do not have that. You will read of the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. We do have that. That's First and Second Chronicles. But we don't have these chronicles uh, of the, the kings of Israel. What we have are the pieces of that that are recorded for us here in the book of Kings. Why do we not have those? Because we don't need them. Because who cares what a bunch of pagan kings did? <laughs> Verse 20, And the days which Jeroboam reigned were two and twenty years, and he slept with his fathers, and Nadab his son reigned in his stead. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. So here you have, you have the story of the, the northern tribe's king, Jeroboam. And now you have the story of Rehoboam, Solomon's son, in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. So both the king of Israel and the king of Judah are greater idolaters than either Solomon or Saul. They, are great. they commit more evil than Solomon, David, or Saul. For they also built them high places. Now Solomon had built a lot of high places. But apparently Rehoboam did better than his daddy in this regard. And images and groves on every high hill and under every green sheet. And there were also sodomites in the land. You know what a sodomite is? A sodomite is a homosexual. And so homosexuality was, was not only tolerated or permitted, but it was encouraged. And if I understand right, uh, homosexuality was associated with a lot of these pagan worship this this 
uh, these false gods that they worshipped, they associated with homosexuality. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations that the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So how do they learn this stuff? They learn it by observing the Canaanites that they were supposed to drive out in the days of Joshua, that they didn't. And they, they were supposed to have destroyed all of those things and done away with all those things. And how could, you, how could you ever make those kinds of choices? Well, once again, look at our country. Look at what's happening right now today with sodomy. The, the fancy name for it is homosexuality. The Bible name for it is sodomy. And I'll bet you, I'll bet you there are still sodomy laws on the books in Texas. Uh, unless they've gone back and, and, and reversed them, they used to be. Uh, and and so, so here, here's the deal. <clears throat> Do we hate homosexuals? Of course not. Of course we don't hate them. They are deceived. They, they are deluded. But Wendy and I were just talking. There's a fancy preacher uh, in, down in the south, and he's having some big conference. And he's going to have, here in the next month or so, he's going to have people speak from his pulpit who are homosexual, who are married, two men married to each other, who claim to be Christians, and they're going to be there and they're going to be speaking at this conference at a church. And his daddy, who just passed away earlier this year, is rolling over in his grave, I guarantee you. I, I, I'm not surprised because I learned about this fellow way back years ago and it doesn't surprise me that this is the direction that he's gone. But listen to me. Look at, the, look at the consequences that Israel faced. Look at the consequences that Judah faced. We will feel these consequences in our country. And I believe, I, I've said this for years now, I believe the defining issue of the church in the 21st century is how we deal with homosexuality. And when you, when you give into it, like what this conference is doing, when you say that it's okay, you, you cross a line with God. You, you can't say that something is okay that God calls sin. You dare not ever do that. Now, you might love these people who have made these choices. Good, you should love them. You should love them. You should pray for them. If you have a friend, a family member, someone that you love that's making a choice to, to saying that they want to be a homosexual or that they're transgender or something like that, you should love them. You should, you should try to keep the communication open with them so that you can talk to them. You should pray for them. You should spend lots of time praying for them. But you should also be very careful that you don't tell them that it's okay. And you can never cross the line. You, you, here, here's the thing. And when Katie and I were talking about this just the other day. <clears throat> Could a person who's a Christian pursue that avenue? Yes, they could. Because a Christian can commit any sin that a non-Christian could commit. But here's the deal. Homosexuality is a sin. And any time that you say that something is not a sin that God says is a sin... You are on thin ice. You are at a very dangerous place in that situation. All right? And so, uh, and then by the way, at Corinth, there were believers at Corinth who came out of that kind of lifestyle. As Paul says, you used to be these things, right? So, could a murderer get saved? Yes. Could a homosexual get saved? Absolutely. Can you stay in a homosexual lifestyle and be in good standing with God and the church? No, you, you, you can't. You cannot. And the church dare not allow that because there's going to be consequences for that. And so, uh, so it, it says there that, that you know they have all of these things. Sodomites in the land, they did according to all the abominations and na nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem, and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all. And he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. And he just comes in and just takes all the treasures, all of that gold. There's no telling how much that was. I mean, we, we read about Solomon making those shields that they hung in the house of the forest of the Lord and, and, and uh, you know, all of, all of the, the gold that Solomon had brought. Well, Shishak, the king of Egypt, he just comes in and he just takes it. What does it say about a nation when another nation just walks in, kicks down the door, and takes what you have? 
It says, number one, they don't fear you. Number two, they don't respect you. Number three, you haven't done anything to keep treaties going. Solomon had treaties with Egypt. Why? Because Solomon's wife was an Egyptian princess. But by the time of Rehoboam, now Shishak, he just he has no respect and no fear. And if you're going to be a nation, you have you, you either better have some good treaties with some people who can help you, or you better be strong enough to protect yourself. And Rehoboam was neither. So here's what you see during this time. You see God's hand of protection removed from Israel. They couldn't touch Israel during the days of David. David conquered all of his enemies. He was on God's side and God was on his side. But now Rehoboam, he's turned his back on God and God has lifted his hand of protection and in come the Egyptians. It says, uh, uh, King Rehoboam made in their stead brazen shields. Now, you... uh, if you've ever seen the difference between gold and brass, uh, you realize that the brass kind of has sort of a golden color, but it's real easy to tell the difference, especially when it's polished. Real easy. Uh, one time, my friend bought a ring thinking that it was gold uh, with a big diamond in it, and uh, I, I convinced him to uh, take it to a pawn shop because he bought it for $100, and you know we thought we could get several thousand for it, I knew that he couldn't, but but I, I convinced him to take it to the pawn shop. So he put it on. He came up with this story. He was going to say his granddaddy gave him that ring, and, and now he was broke, and he had to sell it. And we walked through the doors of the pawn shop, and the guy from as far away from here to that door probably, he looks at my friend, and he says, Oh, what do you got there, a street ring? That's nothing but brass and glass. Instead of gold and diamonds, it was brass and glass. So it's real easy to tell the difference between brass and gold. But Rehoboam, he lets him steal the shields that his daddy had made that were pure gold. And the only way that he can replace them is to replace them with brass, which is much, 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 much less in value than gold is. And so, uh, like like matter of fact, uh, a gold a gold coin about that big around right now is worth almost two thousand dollars and a brass coin about that big around right now is probably not worth but about three dollars four dollars something like that okay so so it just goes to show you the difference between when solomon was king and his son in one generation the wealth of the country is just decimated okay He says he made them uh, brazen shields, committed them into the hands of the chief of the guard, which kept the door of the king's house. And it was so when the king went into the house of the Lord that the guard bare them and brought them back into the guard chamber. They're they're parading them around. His captain of the guard, they're packing these brazen shields. And everybody, you know, I mean, just think about it. Everybody in the entire nation of Judah is sitting there and they're watching this and they're going, you know, those shields used to be gold and now they're brass. It's just like what happened in our country with our money. Used to, back in the 40s, 50s, early 50s, if you had a dime, that dime was actually made out of silver. And so if you can find a dime, and I can't remember the date, I want to say it's 1951 or 2 or 3 or 4 or something like that. If you can find a dime that's minted before that, that dime is is a, a large portion silver. Not today. Today it's made out of nickel, copper, very, very uh, uh, lesser materials. And so, so it's, it's, you know, the the old, the old guys, they, they said, ah, those shields that the guards carried, they used to be solid gold. Now they're just brass. And it's just a reflection of the, of the, 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 the drop in value of everything in the whole kingdom. Verse 29. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? We have that book. That's 1 and 2 Chronicles as a part of our Bible. And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. They hated each other. It was constant war. So so not only do you have wars uh, with other kings, but you have civil war right there in the land of Israel. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried in his fa- in, uh, with his fathers in the city of David. And his mother's name was Naamah, an Ammonitus. And Abijam, his son, reigned in his stead. So Abijah is the son of Jeroboam. He died. 
Ahijah is the prophet from Shiloh who told Jeroboam's wife that her son was going to die when she got back to the city. And Abijam is the son of Rehoboam who is now going to be the next king of Judah. I just want to encourage you tonight. As I said, please don't be discouraged as you look around. God is good. God is on his throne. God has a plan. God is mighty to save. Uh, he, he is not surprised one little bit by the things that go on in our world. He knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. You need to trust Him. You need to pray to Him. You need to allow Him to lead your life through the day and time in which we live. And you need to remember why we're here. We are not here to, to make sure that, that this kingdom or that kingdom rises or falls or whatever. We are here for the kingdom of Jesus. He is our King and He has a mission that He's given to us. And that's what we need to be about. And you and I, we have the ability to invite people. We have the keys to the kingdom. We have the gospel. We can give, we can throw that door wide open, the door of Jesus, and we can invite people in. And that's what we need to be focused on. However short or long a time we have here on this earth, that's what we need to be focused on, is telling people about Jesus and living for His glory in the midst of whatever, whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. Amen? I mean, Father, thank you for this night. Thank you for the little bit of rain. We pray for some more. Thank you, Lord, that no matter who the king is that's on the throne here, Jesus, you are the king, and you are the throne on the throne in heaven. And we know, Lord, that, that there's not a, a sparrow that falls to the ground that you don't know all about it. And you, you've numbered all the hairs on our head. You care about us infinitely, and so we praise you for that. We thank you for that. We rest in that. We pray that you would equip us and encourage us to be a light shining in the darkness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you. I'm glad you're here.